everyone. Yeah. Sorry, I was late. Setting up just a second. Okay, so, okay, welcome to lecture six, Wednesday, the last lecture be uh, before the long weekend with the Thanksgiving. So I'm gonna set up the quiz first, as always. Hmm. This quest six. So all true false questions. All right, so, yep, you have three minutes. Oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> okay, it should be quiz six. Yeah, three minutes. Oh, okay, yeah. so it's actually online. It's on the website, but I'm gonna send that to just a second. Here you go. The slides on the chat. And I'm going to get water. Okay, so you can still participate in the poll, but I'll go ahead with these slides. 
So a uh, few announcements. So next week is Chuseok. It's uh, Korean Thanksgiving. We have a pretty long weekend this, uh, this time. So it's from Monday to Wednesday. So no class at all. So we're going to see a week after yeah, the next Monday. So assignment one is due in two weeks from today. And it's just, I'm repeating what I said, but assignment related questions should go to GitHub Q and A's first. And if they're private, please email TA in charge for assignment one's meal. So, and um, yeah, and then it's, uh, so of course, uh, if it's not private questions, then please do, uh, do it on GitHub Q and A's. So I'll, I'm watching it. Oh, and also um, TAs will be watching it too. Any questions? Okay, so let's do a quick recap of lecture five. So we started with the, the why RNNs are, well, they have some, why they are needed on top of MLP, multi-layer perceptron. And the, uh, the most important fact is that the text data has sequential dependency. For instance, the word Apple could have different meanings depending on its context. And context could be either words coming before or after. But even if you're just looking at the words before, you can usually guess what the meaning is when it's ambiguous word. Here, Apple could mean the company Apple or the fruit Apple. And the Q2 earnings report of Apple probably actually indicates that this is a company Apple. Whereas if you say I ate an apple, then probably it's a uh, fruit. So the fact is that the meaning of a word can have a, can be very different depending on its context. So there is a sequential dependency. And we, the multilayer perceptron not only is not super ideal for modeling such sequential dependency, but also it doesn't have any inductive bias that would try to model such dependency. So if we want to inject such bias, inductive bias, then recurrent neural networks can be very a good candidate. But another question we want to uh, really ask, probably I'm not gonna answer this time, but maybe you know answers already that is sequential dependency really that much important? And the answer is that maybe not. Transformer is uh, probably a spoiler that it's not really sequentially dependent, but still does pretty well. But we'll come back to that for those of you who are not familiar with that. So we went through how the recurrent network networks work. And we saw that basically we are applying the same transformation matrix V to the hidden state recursively to itself. And there were a few problems with this though. If we just multiply the same matrix, uh, number one is that this will result in exploding values. So that's, uh, that means that, you know, if the, the matrix V in the previous diagram, if it, it's, uh, it has values that's bigger than one, then it will basically be exponentiated to the number of tokens. And then basically that just, uh, so you can think of this as a V to the power of L, where, where the L is length of sequence, and VL can be very large if length is long, and V is uh, consisted of uh, um, values bigger than one. And problem number two is that this will still be equivalent to a single linear layer, just like uh, we, how we, we saw that uh, stacking two layers is just equivalent to uh, one layer, right? And you'll actually prove this in assignment one. So that's why we need an activation function. And so activation is not just for problem two, but also for problem one. So in that case, then what kind of activation can we consider? We saw that there were three options, sigmoid, 10H, and ReLU. Here, 10H is usually the, the, the most desirable because 10H have signs, but this does not mean that using, for instance, sigmoid or ReLU would not make it, um, I will say, would not make it Linear, so it's still it's still, it's still nonlinear if you use ReLU or sigmoid. It's just that 10H is signed and also bounded, so that's the good thing. And ReLU will not really solve problem number one because if you actually apply ReLU to itself, then for positive numbers, then you might explode. 
but uh, also there were a few works, a few uh, papers that were trying to use something similar to Relu on recurrent neural net to make it work. Um, we're not going to go into details, but just for your inf uh, information. So it's not entirely probably correct to say that Relu is not applicable to RNN, but in general, people will not use Relu because of the exploding values. So we put everything together and we actually saw how this would work in RNNs. So I'm going to actually um, probably spend one minute on this slide because this can be uh, a, a bit confusing, especially I think I kind of a bit messed up that last time. So, so here, the input is bokeh IDs. And then you basically, bokeh IDs, the shape of this matrix will be batch size, comma, length of the uh, sequence. And of course, because this is book of IDs, you usually use int uh, 32 or int 64 for the data types. And then you use this to actually index or get the uh, embedding item from the embedding matrix. Here, the embedding matrix is a shape of n comma d. And then if you actually retrieve those embeddings, then what will be your input? Then input will be, I'll actually call it X, then this will be size of uh, and, um, sorry, batch size times length times D. Then how do we compute the RNN equation? Well, batch size is just there just for you to actually do several things at once on GPUs, parallel computing. So what you really have to do is then let's define X1 to be the, uh, the matrix at each time step, then this will be just, um, so X here is a tensor. By the way, tensor refers to um, any, I would say size of uh, this, um, it's basically matrix is 2D, then tensor is anything 2D, 1D, 3D, 4D. So it's a more generic term. So when you say it's matrix, then usually it's a 2D. But tensor is just more generic term. So everything is a tensor, but matrix is 2D, vector is 1D, okay? Then X1 is a matrix 2D of uh, size B times D. And we remove this, L because we're just looking at the, uh, the that time steps matrix of the tensor X. Then we want to compute the hidden state in batch as well. So how do we compute hidden state with the RNN equation? Then, um, then the HT matrix, right? So HT is uh, what? Same size as X, XI, right? Batch size and D. And then HT is you apply 10 H and then you have a, um, the previous hidden state and you apply V to this and plus you have uh, the current input and you apply U to this linear transformation and then you might have a bias and bias here is just a single still vector. Or if you actually want to be more, well, it's okay to, say this is a vector because you can do um, what's called, uh, what is it called? Uh, broadcasting, yeah. So you can broadcast vectors, which means that when you're adding a vector to matrix, you just assume that that vector is just one by, uh, not one by, but same size as the matrix for the, the upper dimensions. And they just, you look at the last dimension for element wise adding. So here, let's say that, D is uh, size of D, then if you broadcast, then this just becomes um, here B times D. And then what do you actually put for the, the batch size dimension? You just basically just pad this, no, I mean, you just basically just put the same vector for all the dimensions in this batch. Okay, that's called uh, broadcasting. Then um, this is how you would compute the hidden state at time step t. And you can just repeat this um, for all t in the range of one to 
the length. And then you will have a hidden state for every time step, right? So then you can maybe define H to be just the concatenation of all these HTs, then this will be same size as X, right? And you can play around with this H for your application. And in um, our assignment, you will start with uh, actually playing around with the HL, which is the last time steps uh, real number, I mean the matrix, then this will be B times D. And you can basically use this to obtain um, the, the probability of the, the two classes that you can basically then, what can you do is you put the softmax of uh, HL and then you have to apply this uh, classification linear layer. I'll just call it um, here. O, and here the O is just the matrix of uh, D to two. And what, where's two coming from? Because you have two classes. So you now uh, have a logits for the two classes and then you apply softmax so that you actually make this into probabilistic distribution. And then you apply, of course, cross entropy over it. So this was a little overview of the assignment one. And um, so I think, this should be clear relatively. The assignment one has a few uh, math questions. I'll just skip this. And I wanted to also say that um, RNNs is not super uh, ideal for long-term dependency because you're changing the entire hidden state at, at every time step, right? Because you're applying the V from the previous hidden, hidden uh, previous time step. You're adding that to the current input and then apply 10H. So it is very hard to expect that the model will not change actually will change everything in many cases. That means that it's very hard to conserve the information. Very difficult to conserve. So well, how can we actually resolve this issue? There are several ways. One is that we use gating mechanism, which it's on the next slide. And we can, we can also use attention mechanism, um, probably in future lecture, pooling, um, in today's lecture actually, and residual connection, is not used often, but you can just add the previous outputs. And um, exploiting our vanishing gradient problems, well, you will actually prove this in the assignment that using the gate, gating mechanism actually, no, I mean, using the 10H activation doesn't explode the values because you basically uh, map everything between negative one and one, but still it can explode the, uh, its uh, gradients. And in, in fact, so one um, uh, funny thing is that uh, so exploding gradients can be still handled with the gradient clipping, right? But vanishing gradients cannot be handled with the, uh, uh, well, just gradient clipping. So then one, one has to use gating mechanism. But then the funny thing is that actually this is because it's using 10H. This the vanishing gradient happens because of using uh, 10H, which you will see um, uh, in the uh, assignment. So. What happens if you use ReLU, then actually uh, it doesn't actually uh, vanish, but then still it might explode values, right? So that was actually the motivation behind people are trying to use ReLU for RNNs. It's just a side note that I think I didn't mention in last lecture, but still uh, people use gating mechanisms and the most popular ones are LSTM and GRU. And the gradient clipping idea is simple. Basically if the gradient is too large, bigger than C, then make it uh, smaller than C. Actually, in this case, it will be exactly equal to C, right? Because this will be norm of one. So if you assign your gradient to be C times its normalized gradient, then this will be exactly equal to C. So it's kind of flattening and or it's exactly what clipping is, right? You basically clip it at, that, um, the, at the ceiling C. But the gating mechanism is really the essential for really getting rid of the vanishing gradients. And um, it's exactly, well, and also conveying the information for a long period of time, actually both. And that's actually happening by having this something called gate. Gate is a value between zero and one. And basically it allows you to control how much you wanna pass the previous hidden state and how, how much you want to inject the current candidate of the hidden state. 
here, that's the F is controlling the previous hidden, hidden state. Here, the hidden state actually is, um, well, it's actually, CT is not called hidden state, it's memory state, but um, they just named it. I mean, hidden state, unfortunately, people actually, for uh, as a convention is something that's more of an output. That's why it's, it's called H, but then actually uh, really what, the real, the real, I think, counterpart to the hidden state in re recurrent neural network is CT here. And um, you control the how much you want to pass from the previous uh, memory state, CT, with forget gate F. And it's also a bit confusing because forget gate, if forget gate value is high, it means it will not forget the previous value. So um, if forget gate value is small, then it means it will forget. It's the other way, right? So it's actually a correct terminology probably is uh, unforget gate, I think. And I is input gate, which is um, at least this part is uh, intuitive because you basically control how much you want to pass the current input inputs and the current, um, I would say, hidden state candidate. I'll actually delve into this a bit more after um, actually going over the quiz because I'm a bit behind today. But hidden state then is just uh, uh, function of uh, the memory state. So let's come back to our quiz. I'm gonna end the quiz and we'll share. All right, so question number one. So 93% people said false. And let's see, RNNs with a sigmoid activation wouldn't work because it won't be able to model nonlinear relationship. And you're right, it's false. So why is it false? Because using sigmoid is not about, you know, nonlinear versus linear. Sigmoid still will be able to make it nonlinear. It's just that it's not signed. So it's just people think it's not supernatural, but um, it's then they think it's better to use 10H. But I think in practice, probably there isn't, isn't much difference in many cases. Uh, number two, true or false. Gating mechanism in RNNs prevents values from exploding. And it's actually um, very divided. A bit more people said true. And I think it's almost first time that I think more people got it wrong than uh, right. So actually it's false. Well, the gating mechanism, well, wouldn't really actually, um, so I guess, so I guess maybe um, this was not super good question. So maybe um, maybe they prevent in some cases, but I think you get the point where, where, where I was trying to get. The data mechanism purpose is not about, about value exploding, but it's more about uh, gradient exploding. Okay, so by the way, so a question, so I'll actually go over the, all the quiz and then come back to your question. What's up? But I think, um, this was not a super good question because uh, maybe they will be able to prevent value uh, from exploding experimentally. Uh, true or false, but the, at least uh, I can say that they were not designed to prevent it. So that's, I think, one way to say it. And number three, so true or false, gating mechanism with 10H activation wouldn't work because the values have to be between zero and one to make it work as intended. And this is actually true. So actually more people got it wrong for this one too. So why is it true? Because if you use 10H, then the problem is that the, po the point of game mechanism is that you want to zero the value, but then if you, negate it, uh, if you negate it, then it's not actually you're gating it. It's just you're passing negative value of the previous hidden state. So it's actually, it's, that's exactly why Sigmoid has to be used for gating mechanism and 10H wouldn't work. So any question about the quiz? So I think a quiz was a bit difficult today or maybe was not the best problems. I don't know, but um, actually I'm going to download results and let me know if you have a question. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, that, so Sigma C is actually, um, I'll actually come back to that pretty soon.
because we will, we're going to talk about LSTM a bit more anyway today. So let's come back to your question soon. Any other question? I'm just trying to save in the meanwhile. The quiz results. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, okay, another question, okay. The number two. All right, so getting mechanism in RNNs prevents values from exploding. So, yeah, so what I meant is that the RNNs explode in values, not gradients, values. Values and gradients are different, right? Values explode when RNNs don't have the, um, active, the 10H activation. So basically, that's not, of course, the whole purpose of 10H activation, but at least you can say that's the purpose of 10H as opposed to ReLU, because remember that this values explode because um, if you compute the, um, you know, we call that, um, right? And that means then this is just HT minus one. Oh, no, sorry, because I have to actually take a look at the um, without 10H, right? Then this is just equivalent to right? Then at the end, then this becomes H zero. Um, well, not zero h1 times v to the power of t minus one. And this happens because you don't have um, activation or anything that controls the, 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 the output of uh, this two matrix multiplication. And if you put 10h though, then this wouldn't happen because if you put 10h, then it suddenly becomes you're putting the 10H um, you're putting the 10H like that. And 10H of uh, HV will be always bounded by negative one and one. So this, this value will never explode. But that was the purpose of uh, the 10H, but then gating mechanism is not for about, about preventing the value exploding. It's about its gradient exploding. So you have to differentiate between those two, value exploding versus gradient exploding. Okay, sorry. So not exploding, gradient um, vanishing. Yeah. So it's actually wrong in two ways, right? The 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 ten h so ten the, the true statement is ten h prevents RNs from exploding in values. And gating mechanism in RNs prevents the gradients from vanishing. Is it clear? Okay, and then now let's come back to um, the question from Kim Bosop. Um, so which do you recommend clipping gradients by global norm or clipping gradients by layer wise norm? Um, well, it really depends, but I think so I, I don't think, uh, so I cannot say that one is always better than the other, but in general, you should think that the layer wise is more uh, safer because um, in general, if you do actually globally, then um, maybe they are very different. The gradients can be very different in several layers, but I cannot say it's always the case though. Yeah. So I, I guess like a, a probably it's usually better to clip gradients Layer if possible, but people still do a lot of uh, the the um, global norm clipping, and that's still fine too in in many cases. That's actually a good thing is that it's easier to um, write it. But what what what's the issue with the the the, the global gradient clipping is that if the problem is that if the one of the norm is very big, right? One of the layer has very big gradient norm, then you basically scale. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I'm sorry. 
I was actually about a bit confused about the other thing. Okay, I'll put this the other way. Okay, so this is the this is the thing. Yeah, if you actually do global norm clipping, the 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 bad the what when it, the bad thing that it can happen the bad thing that that can happen is that um what if one of the layer has a especially really big norm but other layers have very stable norm, then then the, you're basically reducing the um the gradient of a good size um, layers, right? So that's a problem. But then the good good part of a global global norm clipping is that you just basically scale it in the global scale. So which means you don't mess up with your with your loss function. Your loss function still will be um, basically you're just your estimation will be still accurate, right? Because you're just scaling it, but your gradient is still same direction. But if you do this in the layer wise, then you mess up with the uh, some of the um, variables with, with respect to other variables, right? So then then your your ultimate gradient that you're optimizing for in your loss function will not be actually equal have a same direction as the the original gradient. So that can be a problematic, but doesn't mean that that's always bad. So. But then I, what I want to say is that it's it's safer to just test the global norm global norm clipping first, but then I cannot say uh, layer wise is always bad. Is that does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So let's move to lecture six, and we have like ten minutes for until our break, and then come back try to cover the rest. So let's come back to this sigmoid thing. Yep, so G stands for gate. And C is just standing for here, the, the it's being used for C, but this is 10H. So actually I was not clear about this, but G is uh, sigmoid and C is actually 10H. So, but then, so sigma c is 10h, but then I think where you got confused was, uh, yep. So the gating mechanism, okay, okay. So maybe this, this was where you got confused. When you say gating, we're referring to actually here the f, i, and o, not the c. So the c part is actually same as just the uh, regular RNNs, if you think about it, right? So it's not called gating. Gating is very specific to the F I and I and O. But you can, of course, LSTM is has a gating mechanism, but doesn't mean that every part of it can be called gating. You just call it gating when you're using sigmoid to compute what you want to pass from the previous hidden state or the current input. Is that clear? And one, one thing I wanted to note here is that uh, when you're computing this, in fact, you can be pretty efficient about this by actually making this a uh, parallel. So um, you, because you have GPUs, you don't want to compute this like several times, right? Oh, you have a question again. So same thing goes for Sigma H. That's right, yeah. So Sigma H is 10 H2 usually. But why do they call Sigma C and Sigma H? Because well, you can use something else, right? Um, you might come up with your own activation function that's like um, very similar to 10H, why not? So yeah, I don't think it's the best way to really, um, I mean, it's not super readable if you call it Sigma C, Sigma H. They're both 10H though, usually. Okay, so, So in general, so uh, one, one thing I wanted to note here is that um, you want to actually, uh, in many cases, you want to actually parallelize as much as possible. And you will see in, in the LSTM, for, for instance, PyTorch code, that they try to parallelize this computation of uh, F, I, O, and C, because they all depend on same X and same H, right? All X, T, and H, T minus one. So how you can do this is in fact, this is like a, a good trick. So FT is a here, a, 
um, column vector, right? So you can actually concatenate FT, IT, OT, and uh, C tilde T in a one giant vector. And you can basically do, well, um, here, of course, you're applying sigmoid and tanh differently. So you will have, but then sigmoid and tanh is just the element wise operation. But so um, before applying them, basically, this is equivalent to. Um, So let me see. Likewise, concatenating all these matrix in the um, vertical way. And then just apply XT. And this would work because this size is still the same. And that's what matters for the vector multiplication here, right? And same for the U. And, and of course you have a bias that's all different. So you have to have concatenation here too. Of course, um, you have to apply the sigmoid um, and the 10 H differently. So in, in practice, what people do is you just compute this first. Let's just call this um, some M. And then what you do is uh, something like FT is um, sigmoid of uh, M of, um, you want to just obtain the first, say, um, how many uh, D dimensional vector, D, D vector, D, D, D dimensions of the vector, right? Something like that. And how about the I? Sigmoid of uh, D to 2D. And etc. So then, this way, then your matrix matrix multiplication can be very efficient, parallelized, very fast. And after you have done that, you apply just input and forget gate to your um, the C tilde, your candidate memory state, and the previous hidden state, a memory state. And then you have one, one more gate of output gate uh, after applying 10H though. And then this output gate can control how much actually you want to. Um, uh, path through. And one important thing here is that the um, this gate, uh, these gates are all vector, not scalar. So they're actually operating for each dimension. And what does that mean? It means that, so memory state has several dimensions and you might want to pass some dimensions and those some dimensions is carrying some information, maybe from very long distance and some other dimensions may be carrying information from recent words, right? So you can basically use your dimensions, different dimensions to carry different information throughout the, the time axis. So that's why it's good to have a vector gate so that you can control, you can make use of the entire vector for your channel. So basically you have a multiple channels for your memory. Okay, so I think uh, it's, okay, I'm gonna cover this just, uh, this bidirectional RNNs and then, and then have a, a rest, a break of five minutes. So bidirectional RNNs is very simple then. We're just talking about four direction, but why don't we also do this in the reverse direction? Then how do we make use of both RNNs? Well, you just apply the RNNs in both directions and then um, you can basically just concatenate their outputs, right? For every token then your output will be two, two times of the um, single RNN's output, but still you can use this for your needs. And also uh, if you're actually talking about text level information, then you can concatenate the last output of the forward and the first output of the backward. What that means is there is a forward direction and there is a, a backward direction. If you want to uh, do some sort of a text level information processing, then just use this one and this one, just concatenate them into one vector. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna stop here for five minutes and um, let's come back at 4.45 for the, uh, the second part of this today's lecture. See you soon.
Okay, welcome back. Okay, so let's go to multi-layer RNNs. So we can also do multi-layer pretty um, easily with RNNs because we just saw that, well, you can just stack one more layer on top of the RNNs, right? So, uh, or LSTMs. So as you saw, one single layer of LSTM will output hidden states. And then these hidden states can be input to the second layers and then do another, um, you know, layer of um, LSTM, and then use the um, do the same thing after that. So it's pretty um, straightforward, and and also stacking is usually causing a lot of um, issues with respect to well the uh, gradients because gradients have to go through these all these thick layers and. Um, they are the only paths that gradient can flow through. So in practice, people found that actually connecting between the input and output of each layer is very helpful for uh, training. It's called residual connection. And I think I mentioned that residual connection in the time axis is not super popular, but residual connection in the, um, the hierarchical axis is pretty popular over different kinds of architecture. Of course, in image domain, that was basically why ResNet was so popular and also was introduced. The name itself actually indicates what RES stands for, right? Residual network. And in text, we don't have that as many layers as image in text, but then still residual connection oftentimes proves to be very helpful. And also uh, dropout is also a really important, not just for RNNs, but for various architectures, even used these days to regularize your model. So what is regularization or what is meant to regularize your model? It means that you basically prevent it from overfitting. And well, so here's a really uh, important, I would say, uh, concept that kind of has changed. So I think I mentioned in the one of the early lectures and also on GitHub q and that the notion of overfitting has kind of changed over last, I would say, three to four years. Because uh, before then, like even like three years ago, people thought that the overfitting happens because your model is too big compared to your data. And so which, which means then it's not good to have a big model for, um, you know, it's the, the big, so people thought the bigger the better is not true, as at least in terms of accuracy. So, and, and, and at that point, at that, uh, in that age, and if you read these papers, you have to actually think that that was really the truth, the truth back then. And I think even these days, many um, machine learning materials, whether they have not been updated recently or still they are actually not up to date with the recent breakthroughs, they still say the same thing. The fact that you have to assume um, the people back, th back then thought that bigger models don't work well. Well, so then in that case, wh what does it mean then um, the, if you have bigger models, the, it, it basically it will, the problem here in then is then if you have bigger model, then you will actually really, um, I would say, be only good at your training data and doesn't work at all on your test data, right? So, so, so that's why, um, and then actually, if you want to make your model pretty good on your training data, it's oftentimes your weight becomes very large, which means there is really high variance. Um, so there's very, a lot of uh, fluctuations. And that's very actually easy to see in a example of uh, fitting uh, some polynomial function on a few dots. It's very popular examples. So suppose we have exactly same, I just drew the same um, distribution on two different uh, plots. And I think we can just fit a really nice linear line that kind of fits to those points, right? Here, of course, the weight will be something like, um, 
0 0.7, I would say, because uh, here where it is actually, oh, it's better to say this way. And what will be the, what will be the, um, sorry, I'll just use A1 for the X and A0 for the, uh, the coefficient zero. So what will be the A1? A1 will be something like 0.7. And what is, how about a zero? I don't know, zero. But then you can't fit a very um, complex polynomial that will always fit to these points, something like this. Maybe like that. And how many, uh, well, what kind of polynomial is this? This will be really large polynomial, maybe seventh degree. I'll use B for this. Right. And then the point is that these values will be really large. So that was why, oh, okay, there was one question. Okay, I'll finish this and then come back to your question. Sorry. Yeah, it's really easy for me to miss your question because I don't get any notification that you asked the question. So sorry about that. Um, so, well, then that was, uh, that's why people thought that the, the, the uh, really the best way to actually control the um, model from overfitting is controlling the weight size. So that's why people have tried L2 realization, which is that you basically just try to minimize the value um, these weights, if you actually just uh, concatenate all the weights and you call that vector W, then you can actually compute its norm, uh, L2 norm. And you basically just add this to the, your loss function. So L becomes something like, so L, new L becomes L plus some scale and this norm of the, all the weights. Then because we're minimizing loss, that means we want to minimize this weight norm, then you'll actually um, prefer lower weights, right? So that's actually L2 regularization that actually I didn't put on this slide. And I think I should put this on the slide in next semester's lecture because it's good to actually know that to really motivate dropout. Well, why? Because dropout is an alternative to this weight regularization that also helps you to prevent overfitting pretty well. So how does dropout work? Well, you make each value zero with some probability P during training phase. And P is usually in the range of like 0.1 to 0.5. So there is a one in 10 chance that you zero, uh, zero it if it's 0.1. Well, why is P bigger than 0.5 or like say 1.0? If P, P is 1.0, what, what is it equivalent to? It's just a model with all the zero, right? No non-zeros. So it wouldn't work at all. And P equals zero, then it's just the model without any dropout. So it's some non-zero value, but still not too, not too large. And then in that case, so if your standard neural net looks like on the left, um, if you apply dropout, it becomes as on the right. And why is this useful? Well, there are several ways to explain this. And one really easy way to explain is that this is, can, can be considered as an ensemble of multiple models. Well, why is it multiple models? Because um, during training, you're basically just um, activating different um, nodes, which means that different nodes consist basically next time you'll activate different kinds of uh, um, nodes. Here, the activation means that actually the opposite of zeroing it. So if your value survived that dropout, then you have activated the nodes. So because you are deactivating different nodes, then you have a different activation for every training time, which means your architecture is different, right? If you zeroed it, then your connection will be different. So. So that's why you can consider this to be basically you're training multiple models at the same time and then combining them at the, at, 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 at the end. But I think uh, it's a, an easier explanation is actually actually coming back to this like uh, weight regularization. Because the point here is that suppose that you basically just remove like B6, for instance. Then 
if your model is overfitting, then this will just entirely screw up the entire graph, actually. It'll be something like maybe this. And this now has super high error suddenly, right? The point here is that if your model is not overfit, then your model should not be super dependent on single weight in the um, in the model, in the in the uh, in uh, of the weights, and that's exactly the point because you basically just zero random things and still you have to do well on it. Then at the end, even if you are fitting a super high polynomial, you will see that this will uh, b seven b six will have really small values, and at the end, oh then b1 should be actually uh, not uh, the only uh, value that really matters. So um, actually, if you do this, then if you just drop out and at the end, you will see that b1 is similar to 0 0.7, but b2, b7 will actually approach zero. Because um, if you make them actually non-zero, then if you actually drop it, then it, will, it won't work anyways. So. Um, so actually, so if you drop other things, to be more exact. So that's why dropout kind of works. So I think there are two possible ways to explain it. Either you can think of it as ensemble, or you can think of this as a, you know, some motivation from the this linear plot, I mean, this 2D plot. So, and there's one more important thing about dropout, which is that during inference, you do not apply dropout. So uh, that's actually, I saw some, students actually get confused about this. So dropout only happens during training. During inference, you just actually um, have all the nodes activated. But there is one caveat here. If you do that, then your values will be bigger, right? Because you zeroed it previously, but you actually now have non-zero values. So, so for instance, suppose that you see this um, value Let's say these are all summations, right? So th these are all summations of all these uh, nodes with some weights. But then if you actually zeroed it, then you basically just are missing these weights. And on average, how many arrows will you be missing? Well, exactly the P of, uh, I mean, the proportion will be p, right? Because in this case, of course, it's random sampling. So it's not guaranteed that always you will have uh, two nodes missing. But still, there is a, it's likely that ex you're, it's expected that, expected that if your p is 0.4, then you will have two nodes missing. So then this value probabilist probabilistically will be um, three fifths of the, um, the, what it should be during inference, right? So in other words, this is just uh, um, one over one minus P, right? Oh, sorry, the other way. One minus P. So that's why during training, we want to upscale it by one over one minus P. Okay, so there's a question about this slide. From Union, at dropout rate of EZP equals 0 0.5, does it technically take twice as long to achieve the same number of training iterations for each neuron in the model? No, it's not always the case. Um, in fact, it can take longer or it can take shorter. So uh, we you cannot just say that. Um, Wait, wait, so what do you mean by the uh, same number of training iterations? You mean like uh, to achieve same training loss, right? Is it? The sample efficiency? Hmm. So it would be good if you, what do you mean by achieve the same number of iterations? Um, okay, so you mean like a, tr um, okay, so yeah, so I, I see where you're getting. So number one, um, the convergence is not on the training, but it's more on the validation that you have to stop your training. 
So of course, uh, it doesn't mean that of course the training convergence this is bad, but then convergence in training oftentimes actually um, off overfits. And also it might not overfit, but still doesn't increase the accuracy anymore. So, um, so the point is that the convergence is really on the actually validation that on the training that you have to actually track. Then during validation, that's basically, basically inference stage. Then in that case, then your dropout is apparently um, not actually um, applied, right? So it's, it wouldn't mean, uh, wouldn't be actually, oh, it, it's, it's so, so that's the one thing I wanted to note. But then that being said, it's true that your training graph will be actually, uh, you will, it will take longer to actually reach the same validation accuracy. So it's, it's not uncommon to see, for instance, validation um, accuracy wise, your model without dropout is something like this. And your model with dropout is something like that. So it means that initially until the, the crossing point, the model is actually convert, reaching uh, the, it's, it's actually uh, you know, converging more slowly, but then at the end, it converges to a better optimum. But you cannot say that this will be exactly proportional to P. And in often cases, I think, yeah. And the next question was that, except for last layer, all the layers should go through nonlinear activation function. In this case, is the, is the expression still should be scaled by one over one minus P? Okay, so um, I was actually using this some linear layer as an example, but then to be more exact, what happens is um, you can think of this way. So loss function wise, Okay, so let's say that this value is, let's define this one single, um, you, you see this value, let's define this to be just H1, okay? It's a variable. So what, then we apply dropout on this entire layer. Then what is um, expectation of HI if we do not apply um, dropout? Well, This is just HI, right? But then if you apply dropout, let's say that it's a dropout of HI, H1, or but with the probability P, then this will be P times HI. So we're talking about the expectation actually um, of each value. Then that's why this value, this expected value of this node will be P times HI which is not a good thing because your expectation has to match during inference and training. So that's why you actually um, upscale it uh, with this dropout with scale. So, sorry, I, didn't sh I shouldn't say it's dropout. It's more of a dropout without scale. So I'll put, it, uh, I'll put apostrophe on D, but then dropout will basically um, upscale it by one over one minus P, sorry. P is a dropout rate, so it's a one minus P H I right H one. That's why you want to upscale by one one over one minus P, so that you can actually um, have the same expected value during inference and training. Is that clear? If you have, if oh, okay yep, and coming back to the question from. Um, Hyungjin, so do you mean the case that H is residual of X for the next layer? So I think we're talking about the previous slide. Um, H is the residual of X. So here, what is X? So you mean like an input or? I think what you meant is uh, more about terminology thing. So hopefully, if you can actually put this in the GitHub q and then maybe, okay, here we go.
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, you, I think uh, you're getting right. Yeah, so usually, I mean, that's like one option, basically. Or you can define it to be um, the other way, which is H of L, um, well, H of L1 is actually the output of uh, um, X L1 going through this layers plus X1. They're kind of same thing, right? Because, but then the reason why it's better that way is that it, you might want to use the output of the first layer. So how do you define your first layer to be? Is it H or is it the H plus X? In that case, then you, it's better to define it to be um, H as um, X1 plus the output of the first layer. But I think you get the point, right? But you're right though, yeah. All right, so, and then uh, next is pulling. So until now we were considering that um, we were using the last hidden state in the RNNs. So suppose this is like a forward direction then you basically use this one, right? But then, well, you might think, do I always have to just use this uh, last hidden state? Can I also use other tokens output too? And what would be the benefit in that case? Well, because if you use this last hidden state, then during training, every gradient has to go through the entire recurrent neural networks, recursive um, the operations, right? But you might want to actually get the, you might want to flow the gradient through everything directly. It's very similar to residual, right? But then the difference is that the residual doesn't actually happen during the recurrence, but only happens uh, at, the, at, the, at the end. So it's, we don't call it residual though then, so because it's not really residual, but it's very similar. So what does, what do we do? Well, instead of using this last hidden state, so um, if you use notation, we can either use H of L. This was our um, option previously, but also what we can do is we can pull from the entire H. So we have like uh, usually three options. One is averaging it, very simple. Um, one over L and then H of uh, I, one to L. This is mean pulling. And another option is that we can do max pulling. So we are when we're doing max pulling, we usually do dimension wise. So basically, um, Notation wise, I think it's not super easy to write, but uh, the point is that your each dimension will be max over the um, all the time steps. So yeah, probably it's better to say um, using PyTorch h dot max at the dimension one. Why? Because h here is the matrix of size of uh, batch size, length, and D. And we are basically, what we want to remove this part, right? So we, we uh, max on that axis. Or of course you can do the other way, which is H dot mean. These two are really, I mean, they're not too much different. We usually do max. And that pooling is alternative to, of course, using just uh, the last hidden state and in many cases, actually, I highly recommend doing this if you're doing text classification. Although in the assignment, I, don't, I haven't asked you to actually use the uh, pulling just to actually see how uh, the recurrent relationship actually can, um, I would say, be very difficult to train. So if you're getting bad numbers in your model with RNNs, then it's, you're not actually doing it really wrong because just getting using the last hidden state, it's really hard to flow through all the gradients. You have, you have to go through this entire thing, right? To actually uh, compute the gradients. Whereas if you actually pull it, then something like that, right? So vector comes out, then you're actually flowing the gradient at the same time. So it's very more, uh, direct and also very uh, fast, your training can be. All right, so 
apparently <laughs> it took more time than I thought, but at least we got up to here. So I, so I, I made this roadmap, so it's not, I mean, you cannot, don't think of it as like, you know, like golden truth of the NLP research, but I think it's easier for you to understand where you're at. So what we have covered up to now, well, we started with the uh, text classification, right? And then we saw that uh, example of text classification is sentiment classification, which is your assignment one. And uh, we, we now learn how to use RNNs, right? Um, and what we're currently using is what's called the MLE, maximum likelihood estimation. And uh, in the current uh, training paradigm, I'll call it vanilla training. It's like most obvious way to train, which is just give it, give the training data, try to do well on the training data and then test it on the test data. So we call it vanilla, but we'll see how other learning uh, paradigms have evolved since then. So um, we just cover all these one for each. And now today's lecture will do a bit of uh, going from text classification to um, token classification. And then this will be also corresponding to the task, other tasks, including machine reading. And after that, we'll go to um, text generation. This in task is a uh, like machine translation is a text generation task. And also this will uh, allow us to actually talk about um, encoder decoder and attention. And then after that, uh, we're gonna actually stop for a second. I'm not stop, but then we're gonna actually just cover all the formulations first. So um, that's why um, we're gonna go for retrieval, which is actually quite similar to text to classification, but very different in terms of uh, its implication. And then, well, then this actually corresponds to some other, some task in the uh, uh, things like document retrieval, for instance, very obvious. And then we'll actually go to uh, transformer, which will basically kind of replace all the models other than transformer. And um, that's kind of coming back to the um, text generation, but also actually other things too. Okay. Then we'll move to other things. All right, so let's just briefly talk about what token classification is and then probably end today's lecture. So I think uh, that's it for today and see you after it. So. so what is token classification? Well, it's also called sequence tagging. And in text classification, you classify the entire text into categories, right? So sentiment classification, your input is the entire text. Your output is either positive or negative or that text. When you're doing token classification, it's not about the entire text, but you actually classify each token. Then you might wonder, why do you, why do, you do it instead of just classifying the entire text? And number two is how you do it. I'm going to just motivate you why you, you would do it. Well, because you might sometimes want to classify word level information, like part of speech tagging here. You want to actually label each word what its uh, part of speech is whether it's noun uh, or it's adjective, verb, et cetera. Of course, uh, you might ask why you wanna do this. Uh, these days, it's more of a linguistic study reason, but then in the old days, these were really important features for machine learning. Other example is that you might want to actually also do name entity recognition. And in that case, then uh, in fact, we will see that actually in the next lecture that this also actually is a token classification problem that we have to map each token to either beginning, intermediate, or um, others for each kind of entity, which is person, organization, and location. So we're going to end here for today. I'm going to do a quick poll. I forgot to do that last lecture, but please um, participate in the poll to see if um, everyone is on track. Just one second. Poll six. So how was today's lecture? Uh, 
understood all, had some troubles. I think I'm behind. Okay, so please go for this poll. I'll just leave it for one minute and then I'm going to end today's lecture. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, go. Oh, by the way, I think it would be good to actually speak in English because some people are also English only. Okay, then yeah, I'll translate. Yeah. 아스트레이어 전에 있는 레이어에서는 예를 들어 원래 아웃풋이 그 노드의 아웃풋이 1이었으면은 그게 드랍아웃이 되면 0이 되잖아요. 근데 그게 시그모이드를 지나면은 시그모이드 1이었던 게어 시그모이드 0가 되는데 시그모이드 0는 0이 아니니까 2분의 1이잖아요. 그러다 보니까 그게 정확히 1 마이너스 p분의 1뭐 이런 식으로 익스펙테이션이 될수 있는지. Okay, that's a good question. So the question from Hengi was that the if we apply dropout right after the linear transformation, but before the activation, then in sigmoid, for instance, the um, if the dropout actually causes it to be zero, then sigmoid of zero is 0 0.5, which is basically not zero. So in fact, so that's actually why uh, we, there are specific places that we use the dropout. So we, we, we don't want to use dropout at every, um, and we don't want uh, to drop out. It's not applicable to every every layer or every uh, part in the architecture. It's usually after actually the activation. So, um, so there are several good practice where you apply uh, dropouts. Uh, for instance, um, after well the um, what do you call? Well, actually uh, at the input level, for instance, because if you apply input level, then um, that means then that input will be that dimensions will be ignored when you're doing linear transformation on the on that input, right? So, um, so that that's really uh, how the dropout usually works. So dropout is uh, usually applied at the in input level instead of the um, I would say output level. And what that means is that input level means right before you apply some linear transformation. Oh, is it clear? Okay. Yep. All right, so thank you, thank you all. So it looks like um, I'm gonna share the result just for the uh, reference. This is not going to be used for your um, attendance. So don't worry about it. Just trying for me to see how good everyone's doing. And um, so it looks like now we're half half. It's fine. I'll try to have more of these, um, I would say uh, recap session next class too, so that we can go a bit slower, but at least we can actually have everyone understanding uh, most of the things. But good, good that I think no one's behind. All right, thanks everyone. See you um, after Thanksgiving. Okay. If you could, if you couldn't make it in time and there's reason, please talk to the TA, and TA will actually decide if that reason is valid or not. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone.